So um, I, will, uh, I will begin speaking in English. Uh, I'm, I'm very pleased and honored to uh, moder moderate, be, be the, the moderator of this session with three uh, excellent speakers, uh, Professor Mark Fleischmann and uh, Professor Jess Weiner or Weiner and Professor Mark Martin Zinter, who will be uh, the first to speak today. Uh, each uh, speaker will have 30, uh, 20 minutes to 30 minutes, and then uh, at the end of the, the, sec the session, we will have uh, 30 minutes for the questions. Um, now in Portuguese, é, queria agradecer e dizer que estou muito honrado por ser o moderador dessa sessão. É, ela tem três é, pesquisadores e professores apresentando. É, professor Jesse Weiner, de Hamilton College, professor Mark Fleischmann, da Universidade da cidade do Cabo e professor Martin Dinter, que é o primeiro a falar do King's College de London. Então vou apresentar o professor Martin Dinter, é, possui formação pelas universidades de Heidelberg e de Cambridge, com mestrado e doutorado nessas instituições. Atualmente ele é professor no King's College de London e pesquisador conjunto na Universidade de Würzburg, na Alemanha. Suas áreas de atuação são na ética latina, no drama latino, nos epigramas e também na intermedialidade e memória cultural. Recentemente editou o Cambridge Companion to Roman Comedy, em 2019, coeditou três volumes do Reading Roman Declamation e está coeditando dois volumes sobre memória cultural romana, assim como organizando uma série de conferências financiadas pela AHRC, sobre literatura clássica e resolução de conflitos. Então, eu passo a palavra ao professor Dinter, agradecendo pela sua presença. So, uh, professor Martin Dinter, please uh, be welcome and uh, you, you may begin your speech. Muito obrigado por invitar-me. Falo como mais ou menos portunhol e mais português que sorry, mais espanhol que português, mas pode entender muito bom e obrigado por introduzir. Uh, vou falar um pouquinho sobre o vídeo e as metamorfoses em inglês, mas um, Maria Cecília tem o texto e nós podemos um, share o texto, não, Maria? Você, Maria Cecília, você vai, vai fazer isso? Uh, sim, o Obrigada. Okay. É, acho que o Caio vai projetar, né, Caio? Oh, Caio, tá bom. Você, você, Caio, você tem o, o texto e você pode um, share, que é compartilhar, não? Compartilhar. Vou colocar aqui, só um minutinho. Tá bom. E um documento do Word. É, professora, você, qual foi a hora que você mandou, por favor? Perdão? Ah, eu tinha enviado ele. Deixa eu enviar novamente. Tá Perdi ele aqui no, no e-mail. Shall I start and that's going to okay.
Cecília, você está no mudo. Ah, ok, desculpa, eu, eu já enviei, Caio, eu tinha enviado mais cedo, eu pensei que tivesse no Drive, desculpa, foi, eu, envi... eu pensei que fosse outra pessoa que ia projetar. Uh, just a second, Martin. Yeah, yeah no rush, it's fine. Uh -huh. okay. the, talk, the talk is only 20 minutes, so we're not late yet. <laughs> it's a, it's a Sorry. Brief talk. I wouldn't look great. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Excellent. So I'm I'm reading out this text, but you can read along and that makes it makes it easier. So in this talk, let's see, so it's yeah. In this talk, I will explore both positively and negatively balanced instances of represented intermedial transposition. This is an umbrella term, which often refers to conversions from one medium to another. In German, that is median vexel change of media. However, my concern extends past outlining how Ovid depicts different media in his metamorphosis and how his characters affect medical transform, media, sorry, affect medial transformation by weaving, writing, and engraving. Also at stake are the consequences and the impact which medial discourse of its meta-intermediality, so to speak, has on the narrative and style of the poem. That sounds all terribly complicated, but it will become clear when I uh, give you some more examples. There are three categories which I would beg you to remember three different kinds of media. The metamorphoses include basic media as exemplified by images, sounds, and words, as well as qualified media, which can be understood as the specific art forms by which basic media come into being. So qualified media are weaving, stone carving, and painting to name but a few. My analysis will also draw upon technical media, which are the vehicles through or in which qualified and basic media are displayed. In the case of embroidery, the technical media are cloth and thread. Hence, that which is called a medium in art theory, such as oil or acrylic, refers specifically to a technical medium in the vocabulary of intermedial theory. Of its metamorphoses in part is particularly useful for exploring how basic, qualified, and technical media change, since, as its title indicates, the poem revolves around transformations, and that's also the theme of uh, this uh, conference. In what follows, therefore, I will draw upon this source to investigate different means through which of it represents intermediate transposition while also devoting close attention to what happens when these transpositions generate communication problems or create undesirable consequences for the characters involved. Can you hear me all right, yeah? You're... Okay, I just assume. Within of its narrative, yes, very good, yeah, brilliant. Within of its narrative, characters most often engage with media by creating them. This tendency is exemplified by the passage in which the impious daughters of Minos have their looms transformed by Bacchus's power. Here, the technical medium is modified via the qualified medium to create a final product corresponding to a fresh basic medium. I read out the translation. Past all belief, 
their weft turned green, the hanging cloth changed into vines of ivy. Part became grape vines, and what were but now threads became clinging tendrils. Vine leaves sprang out along the warp, and bright hued clusters matched the purple tapestry. So their, um, uh, their looms uh, transform into hanging fruit, so to speak. In this passage, the technical medium is Each of these terms referred to a part of the material object upon which the intermediate transformation takes place. The qualified medium is weaving, described as an ongoing procedure through incoative terms ending in escare, like virescare turned green or frondescare changed into vines. The immediacy of this change is also underscored by the contrast between the recent past, as expressed by the preposition modo, but now, and the perfect tense for and where, and the historical present mutantur became. The verbs of entry and departure, abit and exit, moreover parallel the technique of weaving, which takes place when a shuttle is propelled in and out of an opening within the threads. This activity catalyzes the switch from the technical medium back to the basic medium, as the cloth metamorphoses into the images, shapes, and textures which make up real vines. The change is emphasized through the visual language of the passage, which ranges from description of colors, green in virescara and purple in purpura, to brightness, fulgurum, and shape of resemblance more generally in Fakian. Not all instances of intermediate transposition outline these three stages, the material, technical medium, art form, qualified medium, and result, basic medium, in equal measure. By choosing to prioritize one stage of creation over another, Ovid singles out particular aspects of this process for emphasis. When introducing Arachne, that is a more a better known story than the one I've just cited, he elaborates upon the qualified medium in utmost detail and begins by priming the reader to take pleasure not only in seeing Arachne's finished work, but also in watching while she worked. So he actually uh, makes us focus on what she's doing and not just on what she's producing. Far from reflecting the narrator's own delight as spectator, this statement is programmatic in that it instructs the reader to visualize the descriptions to follow. Ovid provides numerous visual descriptors to facilitate this process. He outlines the shape, the balls, the orbs into which Arachne winds her yarn, the fleecy texture of her wool, which resembles clouds as she pulls them from the distaff, nebulas aequantia. These descriptors are not only intermedial in themselves, since they introduce images into Ovid's textual poem, but also highlight Arachne's success in molding her technical media, in this case yarn and wool, through techniques, winding and pulling, associated with a qualified medium. In contrast, the basic medium, the image depicted in the design of Arachne's finished work, is mentioned narrative. So what I'm trying to point out here is there is actually a lot of ink spilled, a lot of text which uh, looks at the making of rather than just the product. If you compare this to other texts, you will know, for example, uh, Virgil's Aeneid, uh, we are not told a lot how things are made when they're described. They're normally there already. By giving heavier weight to the art form of weaving and by extension to Arachne's role as weaver, Ovid shines a spotlight on her skills, which catalyze her fateful clash with Athena and simultaneously constitute her essence, which will manifest in her transformation. You will remember that in many cases, not in all, but in many, uh, the transformation, the metamorphoses in Ovid's metamorphoses brings to light something which is already innate in the person um, who gets transformed. So uh, Lycaon gets transformed into a wolf after 
behaving like one, people say, uh, here Arachne turns into a spider in the end uh, because she has been weaving all along. Ovid, moreover, makes us, makes, sorry, makes use of the woven images to make metapoetic comments on epic styles. The connection between weaving and literature is not only foregrounded by verbs denoting writing, such as inscribit, literally he inscribes, but also by the conventional epic elements which dominate Athena's tapestry. The central conflict in her woven narrative is an old dispute over the naming of the land in a nod to epics which retell founding myths, the Aeneid, or begin with quarrels over property, which is uh, the Iliad, for example. Her image also includes a council of the gods who likewise appear in assemblies in the Iliad, Odyssey, Agonautica, and Aeneid, to name a few. There is, of course, an assembly of the gods in Ovid, but uh, it's a version of contemporary Rome, uh, which has been projected upon Mount Olympus. Her depiction of these gods is, moreover, not subversive, but traditionally reverent, since she places them in their usual positions of power on lofty thrones in awful majesty, and pictures each god with his own familiar features. Jupiter's, Jupiter's is a royal figure, um, to basically say Jupiter's is a royal figure, meaning he's um, depicted in the way we imagine him uh, in godlike shape. In addition, she takes care to weave out four scenes of contest in the four corners of the web, in the four corners of the web, each clear with its own colors and in miniature design. The overall impression is that of a classically ordered and balanced epic narrative, which respects and indeed conforms to the bounds of the genre. Trust, Arachne's woven image transgresses epic conventions. Far from the royal figure of Athena's depiction, Jupiter is portrayed as a serial adulterer, constantly disguising himself to cheat his conquest, of whom Arachne portrays nine. She also emphasizes these traits in the other gods who populate Athena's assembly. Phoebus Apollo tricks Issy as a shepherd, and Bacchus deceives Erigone with a false bunch of grapes. Even Saturn, Jupiter's father, is described in unsavory terms, since he must have seduced a human woman while in horse form in order to have begotten the centaur Chiron. Arachne's weaving is also non-traditional in structure, unlike Athena's work, which is symmetrically par partitioned into each corner, her image appears to lack deliberate organization altogether. A conspicuous absence of spatial descriptors, like corner or miniature, marks of its ekphrasis of her product, thus fostering a chaotic impression which is further enhanced by frequent asyndetic constructions involving abrupt changes in subject. <coughs> so the way it's described almost mirrors the content. So how in a golden shower he tricked Danae, Agina as a flame, Memnozune as a shepherd, Dio's daughter as a spotted snake. By contrasting the woven products of Athena and Arachne, Ovid explores the communicative potential of ekphrasis. This technique is not only a tool for vivid description, but also a means of drawing subtle differences both between characters at the intradiegetic level and between different literary approaches on the extra-diegetic level, the diegetic plane. By linking ekphrasis to a wider narrative, moreover, Ovid demonstrates its utility in critiquing these very approaches. Arachne's composition, through, uh, dis though disorderly, is well woven, not unlike an epic poem which subversive themes, but perfect execution. Not Pallas, nor Envy himself, could find a flaw in that work. As Ovid suggests, however, technical competence is not the only factor in the success of an epic work and irreverent art piece, whether a textile or a text, is bound to attract detractors. Athena 
not only resentful at being bested, but also offended, tears apart Arachne's embroidered web with its heavenly crimes and turns her into a spider. Is thus plurimedial in that it transposes myth, traditionally encapsulated in oral or literary form, into a woven tapestry, which itself presents metatextual commentary on the written and sung medium of epic. However, this medial creation brings about her downfall. This pattern is also presented in Ovid's retelling of the Icarus myth. The process by which Daedalus, Icarus's father, crafts wings for both of them is described in highly visual terms. Through spatial descriptors, such as he lay feathers in order beginning at the smallest short necks to long so that you would think they had grown up on the slope. Of it enables the reader to imagine the height, shape, and gradient of Daedalus's work. However, Daedalus fails to elevate his craft beyond the image or resemblance of a wing as indicated by the clause ut veras imitetu avis, so that they looked like real birds' wings. This phrase does not only facilitate visualization by providing a common object, bird's wings, as a guide, but also foreshadows and explains Icarus's fall. Hence, just as Arachne, who's not, Arachne was not punished only because she was hubristic enough to compete with Athena, but also due to the problematic composition of her woven tapestry, Icarus, you remember the story, so he, he tries to flee from Crete with his father and comes too close to the sun, and the waxen uh, wings he has melt and he falls down and dies, Icarus suffers his fate both on account of his hubris and the imperfect intermedial product with Daedalus had created. Although the manufactured wings resemble those of birds, they do not fully metamorphose into living, beating wings, which would ostensibly have facilitated a more successful flight. This comparison highlights the high stakes involved in intermediate creation, which, if performed improperly, leads to dire consequences for its practitioners. When created successfully, however, intermediate products can cross seemingly untraversable boundaries. Pygmalion thus carves a figure out of snowy ivory, giving it a beauty more perfect than that of any woman ever born. You remember the Pygmalion story? He falls in love with the stature, stature he creates, and in the end, that stature comes to life. In so doing, he blurs the lines between flesh and ivory to such an extent that the borders between reality and illusion are also softened. Ovid draws attention to these conflations by describing Pygmalion's statue using adjectives associated with both truth, truth and falsehood. It has the face of a real maiden, virginis verae facies, but also the semblance of a body simulati corporis. The statue moreover defies the limitation of a technical medium by taking on attributes which are proper to flesh. Although ivory is hard, it feels so soft that Pygmalion seems to feel his fingers sink into the limbs when he touches them. Despite his skills, however, Pygmalion is unable to complete on his own the process of intermediate transposition from marble to human being. Only when he prays to Venus does the statue truly transform into the living Galatea. The end of this metamorphosis is signposted by the exclama exclamation corpus erat, yes, it was real flesh, which, since corpus is here unqualified by adjectives denoting falsehood such as simulatus, underscores that Galatea is unambiguously and unconditionally alive. By combining his technical prowess with piety, a quality which both Arachne and Icarus lack, Pygmalion thus crosses the boundary between bodily presence and imitative representation, and in so doing passes into the impermissible. <laughs> oh, sorry, yet even this instance of successful intermediate creation is not without its negative repercussions, since by becoming Galatea, fathering Marker as well as her husband, Pygmalion stores up trouble 
for future generations. So there's this idea of incest being punished down the line, which people have pointed out is uh, an issue in the uh, metamorphoses. And in Pygmalion's case, the intermediately falling verses narrate how his great granddaughter Myrrha desires to cross another impermissible boundary of incest, that of desire between herself and her father. Are you still with me? And the, yeah, more or less brilliant, good. Um, let's move to the last section. The border between life and representation is a two-way one. Just as Venus transforms Galatea from ivory into flesh, human beings can be converted into medial products. However, while the former process is one of enhancement, Galatea takes on attributes such as warmth, softness, and sentience, the latter process entails reduction. In order to become media, human beings must lose some of their faculties. This is because living creatures inhabit, by their very nature, more than one medial category. They are visible in form, can be heard in their speech, tangible in their multidimensionality, and in addition to these, possess the quality of movement. No medium can encompass all these categories. Stone is visible and tangible, but neither moves nor speaks, and even the modern medium of film, which comes closest to full transmediality in that it is visible, ordered and conveys animated narratives, lacks a tangible dimension. We cannot reach out and grasp a movie. As one or more medial categories are bound to be lost in translation, intermediate transpositions, which transcendent beings into media, tend to be negatively balanced and are associated with, the, with suffering and death in particular. Echo's conversion from nymph to sound, um, to sound embodies this process. Her corporeal form is progressively diminished through emaciation and dehydration. She becomes gaunt and wrinkled and all moisture fades from her body into the air. This process continues until only her voice and bones remain. These are then separated into two distinct media, which, with the voice surviving on as a disembodied sound, while the bones take on the form of stone. These stones are never mentioned again. Their conspicuous absence fosters the impression that Echo eventually loses even the visuality and tangibility that is associated with the stone, for she is seen no more upon the mountain sides, but all may hear her for voice and voice alone still lives in her. You remember the story, she wastes away until she's only a voice and echo. Read medially, therefore, Echo's fate does not only underscore the severity of her unrequited love, but also by demonstrating how she's reduced from a multimedial being who can move, be seen, be heard, and be touched into the lone medium of sound. Now, I don't want us to be late. Um, how much more time do I have? Uh. Uh. Well, uh, I don't know, uh, 10 minutes, perhaps. 10 minutes, okay, yep, that's fine. I okay. finish in 10 minutes, that's fine. The medial transposition which Echo experiences involves subtraction. Her character belonged to multiple medial categories before suffering its fate, reduced into the basic medium of sound. Narcissus, the object of Echo's love instead, undergoes duplication into multiple media. So I read out the translation, while he seeks to slake his thirst, another thirst springs up, and while he drinks, he's smitten by the sight of the beautiful form he sees. So remember the guy wants to drink from a pond, sees his own image, falls in love with himself. He loves an unsubstantial hope and thinks that substance which is only shadow. He looks in speechless wonder at himself and hangs there motionless in the same expression like a statue carved from Parian marble. Narcissus finds himself reproduced as a reflection that is a visual representation of his living self. Captivated by his sight, he is then reduced by a simile into the basic medium of Parian marble. The coexistence of his image and stone selves is emphasized through repetition, which manifests both in the Epanaphora dumque dumque and in the Polyptotas sitim sitis, as well as corpore corpus. The contrast between the intensive pronoun ipse he himself and the reflexive pronoun sibi at himself 
heightened by the position of these words next to one another, further highlights that the viewer, marble narcissus, and viewed, reflected narcissus, both constitute versions of the same youth, albeit in different media. So there's a separation of him already in the pronouns. Even though Narcissus is duplicated into two separate media, however, they do not replace his living self. The reflected image lacks tangibility, movement, and sound, and the marble figure likewise lacks the latter two of these media categories. As such, Narcissus perishes in a double sense, both physically from starvation and exhaustion, as well as medially. Now, um, Narcissus is not the only character to take multiple medial forms. I think I, I skip that. This is about Niobe. Niobe, if you go and visit Thebes these days, um, you can see that there's a rock, uh, which is a fountain where, where tears come out. And she also, she turns into a stone. And this is also described. Uh, she's somewhere in between a person and a marble statue. So we wonder, uh, he, Ovid calls into the question <coughs> how people uh, uh, turn, well, how people turn to stone. Now let's, let's move uh, to page seven to the paragraph which starts, this potential is fulfilled on a large scale, if we can. Do we have that? Next one, next page. Uh, oh, no, I've, I've got it, yeah, you've got it, yeah, sorry. I'm, it's, yeah, I, I look at a different version, that's why I saw it. Yeah, perfect, yeah. Okay. This potential is fulfilled on a large scale when groups of human characters simultaneously turn into stone. This trope occurs twice in the metamorphosis, first to an all-female group of attendants, to Ina of Boetia, Boetia, and again to an all-male group of Varius at Perseus's wedding. Both, both sets of transformations take place by the power of a goddess's vengeance, the former as a punishment for their loyalty to Ino, who in her role as Bacchus's aunt had incurred Juno's enmity, and the latter by accident after catching sight of the Gorgon's head on Perseus's shield. This divine and external cataclyst distinguishes their cases from those of Echo and Anaxarite, whom I've left out, whose transformations are directly kickstarted either by the, the actions of other mortals or their own emotional attachments. By their very character, therefore, mass transformations accomplish natological functions which individual transpositions cannot. They enhance the fantastic undertones of the poem and highlight the role of divine intervention, albeit often indirect in metamorphoses. These episodes also provide occasion for intersections between narrative and mediality. Eno's attendants are all transfigured while preparing to jump into the sea, and therefore each woman is caught in a different stage of that action. I read out the translation. For she who had been most devoted to the queen cried, I shall follow my queen into the sea, and was just about to take the leap when she was unable to move at all and stood fixed fast to the rock. A second, while she was preparing again to smite her breasts, and as she had been doing, felt her lifted arms grow stiff, Another had by chance stretched out her hands towards the waters of the sea, but now it was a figure of stone that stretched out hands to those same waters. Still another plucking at her hair to tear it out, you might see with sudden stiffened fingers still in act to tear. Each turned to stone and kept the pose in which she was overtaken. Individually, they remain immobile, but collectively, not unlike the various frames of an animated film, their poses create a sense of movement. Ovid prepares his readers for this visual effect through the verb videres you might see. The direction of the movement is, however, opposite to what is expected. The first frame described is that of a woman about to take the leap, whereas the last frame depicts one who is merely grieving by plucking at her hair to tear it out. Instead of animating how the woman progress, from the grieving to jumping, therefore, Ovid rewinds the tape by instead arranging his frames from jumping to grieving. This technique complements the narrative by mirroring the women's experience. Just as they fail to enter the sea, restrained at the last moment by their transformation into stone, the order of the narrative runs backwards instead of forwards. So the next description is again, it's a group um, 
turning into stone. Um, I will read out the translation to save time. So if you can go to the bottom of the page, uh, these indeed deserve the punishment they received, but there was one Acontius, a soldier on Perseus' side who, while fighting for his friend, chanced to look upon the Gordon, Lord Gordon's face and hardened it to stone. Astyages, thinking him still a living man, smote upon him with his long sword. The sword gave. Astyages stood amazed. The same strange power got hold of him. He stood there still with a look of wonder on his marble face. It would take too long to tell the names of the rank and file who perished. Two hundred men survived the fight. Two hundred saw the Gorgon and turned to stone. In this case, the frames of, of its animation are arranged chronologically. The first man to look upon the Gorgon's face turns into stone, followed by the man directly next to him, and finally by the rest of rank and file in the hall. The effect is therefore one of declaration, deceleration, rather than retention, as in the case of Aino's attendants. Both passengers end in a pause, but here the loss of momentum gradually ripples out to the periphery from the central Aconteus Asturias duo, instead of suddenly halting all movement. So you have this interesting thing that the narrative holds, but everybody has turned into stone. So it's quite, quite interesting how this is reflected. Um, the soldier's transformation ends the battle, not only because they can no longer move, but also because their monumentalization attests to Perseus's victory. Their assumption of this role is proleptic for at the time of their metamorphosis, the battle is not yet finished. However, the link between statuary and triumph is so strong that Phineas immediately admits defeat after recognizing that the men have been preserved as marble. Perseus's premature claim to victory subverts epic conventions surrounding Cleos, a quality which heroes typically acquire only after defeating their enemies or accomplishing other great and glorious deeds. Um, in this case, and I'm almost done, Perseus' petrification of the soldiers serves as both the deed which generates Cleos and the monument stemming from Cleos. This double function compresses and thus challenges the usual procedure of epic victory. Because if you petrify your enemy, uh, they're, they're there to witness their defeat. This current of subversion is moreover evident from Phineus's fate. He merits Cleos by being the last warrior standing of his faction, and Perseus accordingly promises to immortalize him in statue form. I will make you, of you a monument that shall endure for ages. This is, this is also what um, Ovid claims of the metamorphosis as a whole at the very end. However, since he is petrified in an unflattering pose, in marble was fixed the cowardly face, the suppliant look, the pleading hands, the whole, the whole cringing attitude, the medium of stone works to his disadvantage rather than to his benefit. Stuck in that posture for eternity, Phineus reminds viewers not of his Cleos, but rather of his servile character. I will not read out the entire conclusion, just saying that what I have tried to do, although a bit hastily, is uh, draw attention to the various media in the metamorphosis and how you change from one medium to the other and how this is not without its own. I hope this was not too rushed. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Dinter, for your excellent talk. And now we will proceed to the talk uh, of um, uh, Professor Weiner. Então vamos agora, agradecendo ao professor Martin Dinter, passar para a fala do professor eh, Weiner, Jesse Weiner, do Hamilton College. Ele é professor associado de estudos clássicos pela faculdade Hamilton. Sua pesquisa e estudos abrangem poesias épicas e dramas gregos e latinos, e especialmente as muitas maneiras as quais a antiguidade clássica continua a ensinar a modernidade. Já trabalhou como consultor de latim para filmes de Hollywood e também trabalhou com um programa de leituras e palestras sobre cultura antiga 
é, no Ancient Greeks and Modern Lives Program. Já fui professor de, de estudos clássicos da Universidade Wesleyana de Illinois, na Universidade de Long Beach, Califórnia, e na Universidade de Irvine, Califórnia, onde ele adquiriu o seu doutorado. Então, eu passo a palavra ao professor eh, Jesse Weiner. So, uh, please, professor Weiner, uh, you can begin your talk. Obrigado. Bom dia a todos. Uh, apologies, but uh, I just began to learn Portuguese a few weeks ago, and so uh, I am going to have to switch to English from this point. Uh, but I believe uh, my, a text of my talk uh, has been provided if it's helpful to read along, and uh, my PowerPoint slides as well. Um, I'll have the I'll share my screen with the slides, but for anybody interested, I've um, in, into the slides themselves. I've embedded links to some of the stories, news stories, and uh, opinion pieces that I cite for anybody who uh, wants to follow up and take a look at them. There we go. Um, slides up for everybody. Yes, perfect. Wonderful. I confess that I wrestled over what to present here today. Much of my work falls in some way under the topic of metamorphosis, whether in Latin epic, on the material and hermeneutic changes in monuments and the reshaping of collective memory, the, transmuta the transmutation of ancient materials to address modern social and political contexts, old decaying celluloid film frames spliced together to tell new stories, or what we might call the Lucretian fiction and the Ovidian or Protean metamorphoses of fantasy. But it also occurs to me that classics itself is presently undergoing a metamorphosis of sorts, at least where I live and work. And these changes extend to scholarship, pedagogy, and administration, administrative pressures on the role of classics um, at universities. As ever, the world is changing and universities are changing with it. And so I thought today's theme of metamorphoses might be an opportunity to reflect upon how I've seen the discipline changing and some of the challenges and questions facing it today. Some of these issues may well be specific to the United States others global, and I hope this might be an opportunity for a productive conversation about how our, how our experiences overlap or differ. With the exception of my longtime friendship with Rodrigo Gonsalves, one of tomorrow's speakers, I've had relatively little opportunity to engage with my Brazilian colleagues. So I'm excited for this opportunity to be here and to meet you all. Ovid's Metamorphoses iconically begins by singing of bodies changed into new forms. I think these opening hexameters ring true for classics in way that run, ways that run deeper than the rebranding of the American Philological Association into the Society for Classical Studies a few years back. In the first half of my talk, I'll give an overview of the political and economic challenges facing classics in the US, at least as I see them, and I'll suggest that US classics is undergoing something of a reckoning surrounding inclus inclusivity and decolonization. Next, I'll turn more specifically to reception studies. I'll share an, an anecdote that to me points towards challenges in post-colonial classics and classical reception studies, which prompts me to ask, I hope not too provocatively, whether post-colonial classical receptions risk reinforcing the institutional power structures they seek to dismantle. Many of the changes in classics were already well underway before I entered the field and, at least for me, are cause for celebration. Projects in digital humanities were established long before the pandemic forced us all to become instant experts in online pedagogy. Classical reception studies are hardly new, though anecdotally, when I finished my PhD, I was advised to hide this work from my job applications. Otherwise, universities might not believe I was a real classicist. 
a decade later, I now hold tenure at a very good institution, largely because of my work in reception. A glance at recent publication titles, dissertations, symposia, and new course titles suggest that, uh, likely as a product of growing concerns over climate change, eco-criticism has become a significant focus. Likewise, earlier movements that made the study of women, sexuality, and gender in the ancient world uh, commonplace in the classics um, have built upon this momentum to make critical race studies central to the discipline, to the discipline and its disciplinary practice. And in turn, critical race theory has made the concept of intersectionality essential, essential to gender studies in the classics. These past few years have seen these metamorphoses accelerate, I think in part in response to accelerating change in the external political landscape. My, my good friend, colleague, and incidentally neighbor, Barbara K. Gold, once observed that many students take classics courses precisely to avoid having to grapple with difficult issues. Students, and sad to say, many professors, often view classics as a safe space away from disturbing issues, a place where they can read old books that will not force them to contend with what they think of as contemporary problems. This is no longer the case, either in my classrooms or in those of most of my colleagues. The vast majority of my students expect their education to engage with the, with the unstable world around them. To put this another way, which reaches back to the wonderful talks from yesterday morning, I teach Ovid's Metamorphoses in many of my classes, both in Latin and in translation. I cannot talk about what the poet does with the metamorphoses in the Arachne scene, or celebrate recognition of a golden line before we discuss what it means to read Ovid in a society with an ongoing culture of sexual violence. As I'm guessing all are aware, Politics in the United States has for decades become increasingly polarized. And this polarization reached new heights in the past five or six years and shows uh, few, if any, signs of abating. Very much connected with this polarization, the Black Lives Matter movement began in earnest with protests in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014 in the aftermath of the police killing of Michael Brown, the latest in a line of state-initiated or condoned racial violence that reaches back to the United States' colonial origins and the Atlantic slave trade. These racial tensions remain on the national stage in the aftermath of the more recent violent deaths of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and Ahmaud Arbery. And unfortunately, this list is far from exhaustive. All of this is felt within US classics. My own students associated the body of Michael Brown, which was left on the street for hours in the summer heat, with that of Polynices and Sophocles' Antigone. And Brian Dory's Theater of War project has since produced Antigone and Ferguson for the stage. For a number of years now, movements to, diver to diversify and decolonize university curricula have taken great books courses uh, at universities in the United States. Often because Greco-Roman antiquities play so prominent a role. For example, student protests at Reed College charged that its curriculum's focus on the ancient Mediterranean was too male, white, and Eurocentric. And those protests were powerful enough to uh, trigger uh, a curriculum overhaul. In 2017, Sarah Bond, a classics professor at the University of Iowa, published what I thought was an innocuous uh, public facing essay on polychromy and Greek statuary entitled, Why We Need to Start Seeing the Classical World in Color. Professor Bond immediately began receiving death threats from white supremacists from the so-called alt-right. And then there were two famous, infamous, now infamous, uh, racially charged incidents at the 2019 annual meeting at the Society for Classical Studies in San Diego, California. One of these gained national attention at a panel on the future of classics 
an attendee suggested that race played a role in the hiring of one of the panelists, a prominent professor at Princeton University. The other incident inspired a group of PhD students of color to organize Sportula, an organization dedicated to providing classic students from underrepresented groups the resources they need to succeed. At the same time, classical receptions around the world continue to transform Greco-Roman antiquity into new and often subversive materials, situations, contexts, and cultures. Enter COVID which has put everyone on edge, heightened existing rifts by turning public health into even more of a partisan issue and added to financial uncertainty. There had already been for years a growing anti-intellectual climate in the United States. Broadly speaking, and in conjunction with the forces of capitalism, there is a short-sighted trend in my view that questions the value of anything that can't be directly monetized. And so science, technology, engineering, and math became increasingly privileged at the expense of humanities and especially language programs. The dynamic was exacerbated by the 2008 financial crisis, which also wreaked havoc on the job market in classics. A 2019 article in the Chronicle of Higher, Higher Education reported the loss of more than 650 foreign language programs over three years. The financial instability caused by the COVID-19 pandemic has only fueled this fire. The pandemic has seen the closure of numerous classics departments in the United States, including one at which I used to work, and more importantly, that of Howard University, a preeminent historically black university in the United States with a rich history in classics. The philosopher Cornell West as a spiritual catastrophe. In the wake of the storming of the US Capitol building in January 2020 by those who questioned the legitimacy of an election, Shadi Barch cautions that for us to turn away from Greek and Roman classics would be to abandon them to the alt-right. And so many classics departments are fighting for survival trying to justify their financial viability and cultural relevance to university administrations, even as the field in the United States is undergoing a reckoning with how to decolonize. All of this affects pedagogy. There is a legitimate problem with accessibility, which Edith Hall has pointed towards in the UK. Who has access to studying Greek and Latin is often determined by socioeconomic class closure of so many Latin and Greek programs at the university level threatens to exacerbate this, pro this problem further, since broadly speaking, these closures aren't coming, uh, uh, they aren't happening to elite universities with an abundance of resources. And John Bracey and others argue that uh, the traditional grammar translation pedagogy is often exclusionary towards marginalized groups. For similar reasons, of inclusivity, Princeton University recently changed its curriculum such that students are no longer required to take Greek or Latin to earn a classics degree. It remains to be seen how many other programs will shift to this model. So broadly speaking, many trends in a rapidly changing world of classics might be described as something of a new or at least newly inflamed culture war fought on at least three fronts a struggle to justify the discipline's continued existence with administrations, governments, and students, struggle against malappropriation by the alt-right, and an internal struggle over diversity, equity, and inclusion within a broader cultural context of racial and political tension. I'd like to spend the rest of my talk on this last point because while I am excited by the rise of reception studies, and the prospect of creating the most socially uh, just field possible. I often fear the mechanics are, of decolonization are at best very complicated. So now uh, let me turn to my anecdote. In the spring of 2015, I taught a seminar at Hamilton College on reimagining the classics, organized around the myths of Medea, Jason, and the Argonauts. 
This was meant to offer students a thorough and theoretically informed introduction to classical reception studies. I had the excellent fortune to have Rodessa Jones, an artist, activist, and founder of the Media Project for Incarcerated Women, visit my class, and she has been gracious enough to visit several times since. And for those unfamiliar with the Media Project, the project works with who are overwhelmingly people of color to transform Euripides Medea for performance as part of the women's own processes of self-transformation and rehabilitation and healing. The afternoon before our seminar meeting, Jones gave a public talk and performance, a major portion of which featured her impersonating a young, newly enslaved woman, making the middle passage aboard a slave ship from Africa to the Americas. It struck me as significant that this imagined prisoner would not have known who Medea was, whereas the European slavers aboard the ship would have claimed the figure and dramatic representations of her as belonging to their own cultural heritage, assuming some level of education or exposure. As Nancy Rabinowitz writes of Jones's work in women's prisons, Jones works within the system. But there is another sense in which Jones works within the system. With its turn towards Greek tragedy and classical reception, the Medea Project works with an entrenched systems of literary canonization, Western education, and aesthetic valuation. In my class the following day, I asked Jones about this dynamic and its politics. Jones humored me, but said only that this was the sort of question that academics ask. I'm grateful that Jones has continued to humor me and to visit my classes in recent years. Jones's implicit point, I think, dovetails with Lorna Hardwick's conv conviction that practice runs ahead of theory. But my question about the politics of reception has haunted me during the intervening years as I've continued to write about and teach classical reception studies and their transmutations of ancient culture for the modern world. But are there limits to the metamorphic potential of classical reception, even with transformations across language, genre, time, and context? I'm hardly the first to consider the politics of reception studies in post-colonial contexts. Prominently, Lorna Hardwick and Carol Gillespie's Classics in Post-Colonial Worlds asks at its outset about the paradoxical interaction between classical texts in post-colonial situations. Are classicists justified in pointing to the importance of Sophocles' Antigone for debates about how rulers should think and act? Or should they shudder at yet another possible example of cultural imperialism with invocation of the authority of classical material in order to shape the development of modern independent nations? Similar questions confuse the introduction to Barbara Goff and Michael Simpson's Crossroads in the, Crossroads in the Black Aegean, uh, also 2007. These examples are far from exhaustive, but I reiterate that the intervening years since these volumes' publications have seen a plethora of new global and socially engaged perceptions of Greek and Roman culture in an ever receptions of the classics have addressed such modern contexts as the Atlantic slave trade and its legacies in, in the United States, serial violence against women in Latin America, and the worldwide plight of refugees, to name but a few. Writing specifically of receptions of Greek tragedy in the past half century, Edith Hall notes that this seminal art form, born two and a half thousand years ago in democratic Athens, rediscovered in the Renaissance as prestigious pan-European cultural property has evolved in, re in recent decades into a global medium. The cultural output of ancient Greece and Rome is indeed more global today than it ever was in antiquity. But I've often wondered, even while celebrating this democratization of the classics, whether there remains something regressive, some legacy of cultural imperialism in these axiological terms to the Greco-Roman canon as models, as if what has since the Renaissance formed a core 
of the Western or European canon has triumphed in some way, perhaps following Antonio Gramsci's formulation of cultural hegemony that lays claim to universality. Aesthetics and canons, especially those that presume to designate a classic, cannot help but be political. And so while I laud the sentiment, I'm unconvinced by Mary Beard's statement that although classics may become politicized, it doesn't actually have a politics. I might reformulate that to say that although classics doesn't necessarily have a singular politics, it can't help but be political. Is it subversive and radical to adapt Greek and Latin literature to undermine and challenge Western imperialism, racism, misogyny, and classism? Or are these receptions of the Western canon doomed to reinforce the very, very hierarchies of power they purport to challenge? My initial answer, and I'm still thinking through this, is both. In a review of two volumes dedicated uh, uh, to global and post-colonial classical receptions, Aaron B. Me asks, rhetorically, what better way to challenge colonialism than by using the very tools that colonial powers used to justify their cultural superiority and therefore their dominance. Immersed as I am in these sorts of perceptions, I wish I could simply embrace me's position. Yet, uh, as the post-classicism's post collective asks in something of a counterpoint, what could be a more perfect realization of the Euro-colonialist stream than an extension of the classical so as to incorporate all areas of the globe. And so I fear the matter is not so simple and I find myself returning towards iconic question, a radical question, but an iconic question and her question to it. What does it mean when the tools of a racist patriarchy are used to examine the fruits of that same patriarchy? It means that only the most narrow parameters of change are possible and allowable, or the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. What then are the possibilities and limits of classical reception when these receptions are performed by and for those at the margins of social, economic, and political power? Can we reconcile the political aim and context of any particular reception with the activity of turning to the Greeks and Romans, or Shakespeare for that matter, as models. For Lord, as my Anitis notes, re the reproduction of patriarchal artifacts, or uh, uh, however seemingly unintended, indicates a deep problem at the heart of modes of existence. I juxtapose Lord's position, or at least my application of it, with one more recently voiced by Shadi Barch. Drawing on Paulo Freire, Barch argues that disconnecting the classics from previous hegemonic histories is entirely possible. I confess that I'm pessimistic about the possibility of extricating ourselves entirely from these power structures, at least in any quick and easy manner, however loudly we disavow the roles of past and present classicisms in the service of harmful discourses. In my view, the politics of classics and their reception can't help but be messy. If we can't resolve these tensions, how best can we work within them? And are the answers different for artists and practitioners like Rodessa Jones than they are for people like me who write on and teach on, teach on their work? In, class, in short, classics in the US and perhaps classics around the world is undergoing a reckoning with its history, its relationship to the so-called Western tradition and its co-implication in that tradition's legacies. I can't say for certain whether this cultural moment will fizzle out uh, or if the discipline is in the midst of a major metam metamorphosis, uh, what it will look like in 20 years, but I'm both excited and nervous to find out. Obrigado.
Thank you very much, Professor Weiner, for your very stimulating talk. Uh, as I, I said in the beginning, we'll have the questions only after the three speeches are given. So now we'll go uh, to um, Professor uh, Fleischmann, Mark Fleischmann, uh, from the University of Cape Town. And I will briefly present, uh, introduce him in, uh, in Portuguese. Então, agora nós vamos para a conferência do professor Mark Fleischmann, da Universidade da Cidade do Cabo. É, o professor Fleischmann possui diploma em performance e em discurso e drama, não, em performance, em discurso e drama, é co-diretor artístico no Teatro de Magnet e ensina tantos cursos, muitos cursos teóricos, muitos cursos que são ao mesmo tempo teóricos e práticos, com um foco específico em dramaturgia e em theater making, né? e em encenação de, de teatro, né? em realização e encenação de teatro. Suas áreas de, <coughs> suas áreas de pesquisas incluem teatro e performance, tradução e performance, dramaturgias interativas, encenações e performances contemporâneas na cultura sul-africana e tragédia no sul global. Suas pesquisas atuais são é, Reimaginando a Tragédia da África e do Sul Global e é, Tradução e Performance. Então, a, eu passo a palavra ao professor é, Fleischmann. Uh, please, Professor Fleischmann, you can begin your talk. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Okay, um, I'm just going to share my screen. Are you seeing the slideshow or are you seeing my notes? We, we see your slide, yes. Just just the slide, that's all you see. Yeah, uh, you is more on the right side. You have a very small image of you, too. But fine, okay, thank you. Uh, Mark, actually, uh, you're presenting the, 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 the notes as, as well. Uh, okay, then I'll have to just close this down and start again. It's okay now. It's okay now. Thank you. Okay, so um, thank you very much to uh, Maria for inviting me to participate. And uh, I'd like to start both with a, an, uh, an apology for complete lack of Portuguese um, and the need to conduct this entirely in English. And secondly, a confession that um, following the last speaker, I am, uh, I must admit, not a real classicist. In fact, I'm not a classicist at all. Um, from the introduction, I assume uh, you would have gathered that I am, in fact, a theatre practitioner and a professor of theatre, and that's the perspective from which I come to this particular topic, as you will see as I go through the presentation. So, um, let me begin. Um, sorry, just... According to Edith Hall, from the 1960s, Greek tragedy began to be performed on a quantitatively far greater scale from more radical political perspectives and in more adventurous performance styles than in any previous period since they were first created in the 5th century BC. These tragedies were not simply reproductions of the extant tragedies of antiquity, rather they were translated, adapted, staged, sung, danced, parodied, filmed, enacted, searching for new ways in which to pose questions to contemporary society and to push back the boundaries of theatre. The 1960s were also the period in which a large number of African colonial territories became independent states, the culmination of an intense period of anti-colonial struggle. It's significant that in the period in which new independent states were emerging in Africa, Greek tragedies were being produced in African theatres in significant numbers across multiple regions of the continent to reflect on and respond to 
the processes of decolonization underway. Since 2019, I have been engaged in a multi-year research project entitled Reimagining Tragedy from Africa and the Global South, funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. My colleagues and I have been interested in exploring the notion of tragedy in and outside of the theatres of Africa since the period of decolonization. One part of the project has set out to archive the many productions of Greek tragedy in various forms that were produced from the 1960s onwards. A second aspect is to use tragedy or the tragedy to examine the processes of decolonization, the persistent conditions of coloniality, and efforts to understand social conditions pertaining in South Africa, particularly since 1994 with the advent of democracy. But a third leg of the project, and the one most relevant here, is the creation of new tragedies through processes of artistic research to shed light on the form and its evolutions as well as to explore the current decolonial condition. Many of the productions in the archival aspect of our project are adaptations. The adaptation comes after the original, but it also emerges in a context of afterness. The particular afterness of colonialism that is haunted by an afterlife, or in Benjaminian terms, a Nachleben, According to Gerhard Richter, Nachtleben is the figure of a repetition that does not repeat, living on and after that both remains attached to what came before and precisely through an analysis of that abiding yet often invisible attachment departs from it in ever new directions. In what follows, I will begin by outlining my understanding of the aftermath of apartheid and colonialism and how it relates to tragedy and the tragic then discuss two cases, my own work with tragedy and the work of my colleague and collaborator Man Lam Botwe, that reflect two approaches to tragedy as it manifests in the particular circumstances of post-apartheid South Africa. And thereafter, I will attempt to relate these works to the idea of afterness and metamorphosis with reference to Ovid and Kafka. The aftermath of apartheid in South Africa is a place-time suffused with coloniality but in which possibilities for a better future exist, but not yet. This place time doesn't only have an afterlife, it has a prehistory in the writing of figures like MS Zaire, Leopold Sedar Senghor and Franz Fanon, a prehistory that is saturated with futurity, despite the colonial conception that the disposition towards the future and the capacity for futurity was the monopoly of Europe. As Achille Mbembe writes with reference to Fanon, the time of decolonization reflects the permanent possibility of the emergence of the not yet, the possibility of reconstituting the human after humanism's complicity with colonial racism. The problem, though, is that there is no indication of when or how this future possibility will arrive. In fact, it seems that we are caught in a perpetual present overwhelmed by a past that will not pass struggling to imagine any future at all that is not more of the same. As Selwa Lust Bulbina suggests, and I quote, decolonization is a becoming that inevitably remains incomplete. It is not a present endowed with a future that would have an end. It is a continuous present deprived of any teleology, end quote, which might be one way of understanding its tragic sense. At a quasar, recent book, Tragedy and Postcolonial Literature, highlights the production of a sense of indeterminacy and precarity, both within the colonial period and its aftermath. For him, following Fanon, the colonial or postcolonial subject is set permanently on edge, both the cliff edge of existence, living under the threat of erasure at all times, and the more colloquial sense of uncertainty, anxiety, and even terror. Quezon suggests that to understand tragedy within the post-colonial requires a shift in focus from fate, necessity and catastrophe to the representation of pathos and suffering. While some post-colonial works do end in catastrophe, he says, it is the depiction of pain and an unrelieved emotional suffering that proves consequential for the tragic tenor. Bernard Waldenfels suggests that pathos is something that happens to us overcomes, stirs, surprises, and attacks us, and that it announces a learning through suffering 
yet not a learning of suffering. He goes on to argue for a temporal shift which emerges from the antecedents of pathos and the deferment of response. He describes this temporal shift as diastasis, an originary splitting which produces a context, albeit a broken one. The antecedent pathos and the deferred response have to be thought of together, but only across a gap which cannot be closed and thus requires a creative response. In a medical context, diastasis is a condition following pregnancy in which the abdominal muscles are split or torn apart and the internal organs have only a thin band of connective tissue in front to hold them in place. A condition that suggests exposure, fragility and vulnerability. I would like to propose that what shapes the works under scrutiny in my paper is the place time of the gap, the broken context between the pathos and any attempt to provide a significant and sensible response. It is not the place time of the willful subject who performs acts or commits deeds, but of the fragile, vulnerable and exposed subject who suffers in the face of a traumatic history and in the context of a seemingly endlessly distended present defined by struggle, precarity, violence, invisibility, estrangement and unbelonging. As Achille Mbembe comments, and I quote, Indeed, not long ago, the drama was to be exploited and the horizon of liberation consisted in freeing oneself from exploitation. Today, the tragedy is less in being exploited than in being utterly deprived of the basic means to move, to partake in the general distribution of things and resources necessary to produce a semblance of life." End quote. For Raymond Williams, such a place time in which the incorporation of all people as whole human beings is in practice impossible provides the ground and necessity for revolution. But instead, all we witness in the colonial aftermath are periodic moments of spasmodic volcanic transgression that shatter the fragile facade of normality temporarily, while at the same time shattering the disruptors themselves in many ways. disappear completely. It continues to hover as a haunting or teasing that stretches out the present, making it difficult to abandon hope completely or finally. Unlike Williams's idea of tragic stalemate or deadlock as a theme of a whole school of dramatists through the 20th century, in David Scott's terms, the problem space of the colonial aftermath is always conditioned by its horizon of expectation, which remains, despite all, the future achievement of freedom. In this sense, the time of the post-colonial is Agamben's future anterior. Following Enzo Melandri, Agamben describes this as a way walking into the future backwards, which I take to mean that the future can only ever be approached by a digging in its past, an archaeological engagement with futurity. This is how I see the tragic action of the works under scrutiny here, a frantic and repetitive digging in a traumatic historical past in a disordered and fragmented manner or in a manner that disorders and fragments in the doing, in an almost futile attempt to touch the future. Almost, but not quite, and not yet. Antigone Not Quite Quiet is the third production I have made over the past 27 years that uses ancient Greek tragedy as its source, but adapts it to reflect on the context of a South Africa trying to emerge from colonialism and apartheid. It is a set of responses to the play Antigone from the perspective of three of the play's characters. The production is structured in three sections. The first section, Ismeni, is a solo perf performance performed by Jenny Resnick, dressed in white and covered in white makeup from head to foot. It is based on a text written by Resnick which plays out as an extended soliloquy. Here, the very old Ismeni is trapped in a perpetual existence that involves a constant return to what she believes to be the grave or tomb of Antigone and a repeated retelling of the story of the family of Oedipus again and again for eternity. She is obsessed by the idea that the audience find her to be unbearable. She is ashamed by her interminable age, by the fact that she did nothing to help Antigone, but mostly because of her whiteness a whiteness that is recognized to be responsible for the excesses of the past, of colonialism and apartheid, but also a whiteness that will not, or perhaps cannot, 
go away. The second section, Antigone, focuses on Antigone trapped in the cave or death. It is performed by a 13-person chorus, a multiple embodiment of the eponymous heroine of Sophocles' play. It is a 40-minute vocal musical work composed and arranged by Neo Muyanga. It is made up in part of original material based on poetic text in response to the play Antigone, written for the production by poet Mandisa Wundler in part of struggle songs, church music and laments, and in part of fragments of text from the original play. This section can best scream the resounding voice of the youth of the new South Africa, angry with the slow pace of change. It expresses the struggle against the power of whiteness that continues to control so much of the society 27 years after the supposed end of apartheid. The third section, Tiresias, is a rendition of Tiresias' vision in a 15-minute video installation focused on blindness on three flat-screen TVs mounted like a triptych at the back of the rectangular stage space. The text here is a poem in Isikosa by S.E.K. Mkai, written in 1908 about the relationship between the Amakosa king, Ngrika, and his dog, Mbambushe. The poem itself is a meditation on leadership of the lack thereof, and has an idiomatic subtitle, Ninganiki Okuntoele as in Jenny, Give Not Unto Dogs Sacred Things, which became the subtitle for the production too. At the end of the third sections, the heavens burst, but instead of raining water, stones rain onto the empty stage, even as we hear Ismeni calling from offstage the lines that started the first section to begin the cycle again. The Antigone production does not ascribe to any apparent narrative arc. In fact, it refuses narrative development completely. It selects three characters from the original play and then designs a particular performance intervention around that particular character. But in doing so, the nature of character subjectivity is undone by means of the shift from the individual to the choral to the mediated. In the process, the original play from the past is broken into fragments or pieces and is then selectively and one might say transgressively reassembled for present day purposes. In my view, the problem space of the post-colonial present leads directly into the production of Antigone Not Quite Quiet. The production reflects the complex challenges of the decades of freedom, the ways in which old political identities and institutionalized privileges from the past continue to haunt the survivors of the catastrophe in the present, leading to increasingly transgressive acts which nonetheless lack the force to change the reality that we continue to exist in the same space at the same time. And while we continue to live together in close proximity, we seem unable to understand each other across intersecting divisions of race, gender, class and sexuality. Like the three parts of the triptych that is Antigone not quite quiet, we reach but cannot touch, we touch but cannot bind into any sense of a whole, we remain inevitably inconvenient to each other, immovable from our common landscape. Despite lofty ambitions of reconciliation and social cohesion or our deepest, darkest desires to be rid of each other, we are stuck together. This is the tragic sense of our post-colonial present. The catastrophe of liberation has morphed into the catastrophe of freedom. I want to suggest that what distinguishes the Antigone production under review here is the increasing adoption of a ruinous production principle. The rejection of logic, wholeness and ordered storytelling and a preference for fragment, disorder, disruption and discord. But while the transgressive force of production of a classical work such as this one that employs such aesthetics is productive in the way that it attempts to represent the complex realities of our current historical present, there is something else that these leftovers do. The classical archive masks other claims to tradition. What the Antigone production does is attempt to reveal another reality, another possibility, by introducing the Mkai poem in the third section. The introduction of the poem displaces the text of Antigone entirely, so while the remnants of the classical archive continue to litter the landscape of the post-colonial present, not only are they falling apart and losing their old function and meaning, but their capacity to hide other claims to tradition is also being challenged. The classical archive, at the very least, cannot any longer have the landscape all to itself. This brings me to the second case. 
If the first case can be defined as a political response to the colonial aftermath through the adaptation of existing tragedy, I would argue that the response outlined in the second case is a reimagining of the tragic to engage more metaphysical concerns. In an essay that is fundamental to an understanding of tragedy in African theatre, the fourth stage, Wole Shoyinka writes that tragedy is the most insistent voice that bids us return to our own sources, and for him that means returning to Yoruba sources. In the essay, he outlines a theory of what he terms Yoruba tragedy. He argues that Yoruba tragedy plunges straight into the tonic realm, the transitional yet inchoate matrix of death and becoming. He describes a world that is made up simultaneously of three different domains of being, that of the living, that of the ancestors, and that of the unborn. Between these domains lies an essential gulf that must be constantly diminished by the sacrifices, the rituals, the ceremonies of appeasement to those cosmic powers which lie guardian to the gulf. This gulf is the space of transition that Shoyinka names the fourth stage and describes as the vortex of archetypes and home of the tragic spirit. For Shoyinka, tragedy in a Yoruba context involves a disturbance in the space of, of transition, a blockage of some kind a primal severance of transitional ether that upsets the totality of being. Tragedy in Yoruba traditional drama is the anguish of the severance, the fragmentation of essence from self, and this anguish demands symbolic transactions to recover the totality of being. What this suggests is a conception of tragedy embedded in an African world from a primarily metaphysical standpoint, and yet the metaphysical is also impacted on by the political because in the colonial context it is most often the political that causes the disturbance, the blockage or the severance of being. Mandla Mbotwe grew up in the Cape Town township of Nyanga and trained to be an actor at the University of Cape Town, after which he worked as a community arts activist for a number of years before joining Magnet Theatre in 2000. He is now one of three co-artistic directors of the company. The work I will focus on here, Ngeba Lompilisi, Wound of a Healer, was created in 2010. But in reality, it is part of a broader repertoire which includes works like Did We Dance of Kuchona Komendi of 2012, G7 of recently Ichelare Triza of 2020-2021, of of all of which exhibit consistently similar formal characteristics and thematic concerns. Ngeba Lompilisi is set on the N2 highway that links Cape Town in the Western Cape province to the Eastern Cape, the traditional home of the Kosa people. According to a note in the published text, there have been many accidents along this highway and there are lots of dead bodies that have not been found and taken home to rest. An old woman, the healer named in the title, has been present on this road for many years, seeking out the lost spirits and trying to put them to rest in a makeshift graveyard she has constructed next to the road. The linking of the production to the in-between space of the highway is connected to the sense of displacement that many people in South Africa live with, but it also acts as an image of the space of the present between the apartheid past and the desired future. And Botwe is concerned with intervening in the present, motivated by his belief that there are absent voices that need to be brought back into view and that need to be given a hearing. As he puts it, without the stories of the disappeared, we are not whole. Without their stories, our spiritual and traditional being is empty. Ngeba Lompilisi tries to place the stories of absent voices back in the landscape. There is a choice in the production to limit the words spoken and to use the body as a primary means of expression. Dance forms a significant part of the performance. A repetitive choreography of obsessive and desperate gestures are set against a musical score created and sung by the company. The introduction of dance here is significant in a number of ways, not least because of the focus on speaking the unspeakable. Dance performs an interruption, a cut across the language of theatre, that offers a different kind of sense. In this way, the sensible, rather than the semantic, predominates in what Jean-Luc Nancy terms a syntax of feeling. But Mbotwe also employs a densely poetic linguistic text, spoken, chanted and sung in the Kosa language. The particular dialect used is not that spoken by urban Kosa people, such as the young performers who make up the cast. The actual language spoken is referred to by them as deep Kosa and is spoken only in the rural Eastern Cape. This again creates an alienating effect that increases the sense of dislocation at the heart of the production. This is not because the performers have lost their language, but because they are lost within their language. 
They are struggling to make sense of it and to own it along with the urban audience they are playing to. Furthermore, the manner in which the verbal text is performed, a combination of heightened speech, chanting and song that is more operatic in scale and extension than is conventional in theatre work, emphasizes the sound qualities of the words, even when those words are difficult to understand. This engagement with the sound of the word again heightens the visceral quality of the language and links the semantic sense of words with their somatic sensuality and emotional force. Following Josephine Macon, the words touch the unconscious, so an ineffable experience is felt in appreciation. But this happens in her words because the audience hears the words first with their bodies, with the primordial sentient knowledge. To achieve this, the transcendent quality of language itself is manipulated, enabling the verbal act to return to the tonic forces and possibilities of the imagination." End quote. This suggestion of Chthonic forces here is interesting because it echoes Shoyinka's linking of tragedy and the Chthonic realm. For Shoyinka, the score of song sounding in poetic language is a tragic echo from the void. It is the stricken cry of man's blind soul as he flounders in the void and crashes through a deep abyss of a spirituality and cosmic rejection. One of Mbotwe's key concerns as a theatre maker is to bring the experience of ritual in African tradition into the theatre and into conversation with modernist or avant-garde theatre practice. In the production, traditional practices, ceremonies and rituals uh, ju are juxtaposed with the technology of video imagery, uh, mirroring the almost schizophrenic temporalities of the African urban experience. Ultimately, though, what links all of Mbotwe's works is the presence of a woman or women usually dressed in the traditional black mourning dress, engaged in an extremely physical and desperate and agitated manner with a chorus of unsettled, unrooted beings who exist in a space between life and death, present and past. The souls on the highway in Ngeba, the drowned soldiers dancing under the sea in Mendi, the assassinated cadres in the memories of their mothers in Okwebokwe. The tragedy is that they are caught in the space of transition, unable to advance, and the performance becomes a way in which to try to unlock them, to send them on their way. It does this through a dramaturgy based on ritual, in which the chorus repeats symbolic actions over and over again, night after night, and in which the audience become active participants rather than consumers of an unfolding narrative. These actions are physical, vocal, musical and poetic, and they are less about the evocation of narrative action or the unraveling of an heroic character than they are about responding collectively to the pathos of the situation. The unsettled figures in Mbotwe's choruses reflect the anguish of the severance of self from essence, the upset in the cosmic totali totality brought on by the ravages of coloniality in the past and in the present that will not pass. This is why I understand his approach to be fundamentally metaphysical. In his productions, Mbotwe seeks for a creative response to the diastasis through a recuperation of indigenous form grafted with Western dramatic modalities and comes up with a ritualistic dramaturgy that is tragic in form, not because it is based on any pre-existing tragedy from the colonial canon, but because it fashions its own response to the tragic sense of the time. What is the relationship between works such as those that I have discussed above and the concept of afterness, and how does this link to metamorphosis? The adaptation evidently follows its source. In this sense, it comes after or reflects a state of afterness. But what is the nature of this following? As Gerhard Richter puts it, does what follows mark a clear break with what comes before? Or does it paradoxically perpetuate its predecessor by remaining bound to the concepts and conditions of, from, of that from which it was thought to have taken its leave? In the case of the African adaptations under discussion here, the following is certainly not linear. The adaptations via offered quite radical tangents to engage immediate concerns of the particular present in which they emerge. These shifts are not only in terms of content, but of the form itself. In this sense, they are metamorphoses and, they break, and the break seems to be complete. But is the story that straightforward? One of the symbolic images used to understand afterness and its metamorphosis is that of the echo. Richter turns to Ovid to explicate this relationship. In Ovid's depiction of echo in the story of echo and Narcissus, the nymph has lost her capacity for speech except to repeat the last words of anything she hears others utter. But this leads to a difficult encounter with Narcissus and his rejection of her, and spurned shamefaced, she slips into the wood and, and hid herself, living alone in caves from that time on. And there she wastes away in grief, her sad body 
reducing her to dried out skin and bones, then voice and bones only, her skeleton turned, they say, into stone, now only voice is left of her, only the sound that lived in her lives on. From this, two things emerge for me. First, as a form of afterness, the language of echo is always the language of the other. Even the most original of manifestations is tethered to something or somewhere else. There are no clean breaks, only refigurings that remain linked to a complicated and conflicted past. The language of the other continues to hold us in its grip. Second, in the transmission of works across time and geography, what remains in transmission is often not the whole, the body, but fragments, a limited and reduced voice echoing across time and space. What remains in the aftermath is the detritus of the catastrophe of which the aesthetic forms and texts of the past are a significant part. In the view of Marianne MacDonald, there is a new generation of artists adapting ancient tra tragedy. This new generation sees no patterns, no sense to the suffering. The difference with previous generations of adapters is that while they were able to create sense out of the fragments of the past, for the new generation, everything is just bits and pieces. But from these bits and pieces, something emerges which from the perspective of the colonial center might be described as monstrous. Yet as in Franz Kafka's Metamorphosis, where Gregor Zamza awakes transformed into an insect, the exact nature of which cannot be determined and which is considered monstrous by those who witness it from the outside, the monstrous thing has its own beauty. The family are clearly disgusted and alienated, but the reader is drawn in, feels for and identifies with Gregor in his experience. After trying to accommodate themselves to the change in their son and brother, the family come to the conclusion that no accommodation is possible. There is no understanding the monstrous other, no agreement to be reached with it. We must get rid of it. He must go, cried Gregor's sister. That's the only solution. And yet they are helpless. There's nothing they can do. What Gregor, who they once thought they knew and loved, has become, lies beyond their reach has shifted too far away. So they push it back into its own room and the door is hastily pushed shut, bolted and locked. And in the story, Gregor simply expires in his isolation. The Nigerian novelist Adrian Igoni Barrett, who has written his own version of the metamorphosis, Black Ass, in which a black man in Lagos wakes up as a white man, asks, why does Gregor the king of the cockroaches. Perhaps that is what is happening with classical reception in decolonial post-apartheid times. The production of monstrous figures through adaptation and transmogrification. And however much those who would have the past remain intact and unchanged and the present in a state of indebtedness to it, hope it can be got rid of or relegated to a silent margin, it will not, like Gregor, go quietly. It is more inclined to becoming the king of the cockroaches. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Fleischmann. Uh, now we will proceed to the questions uh, after this uh, extremely uh, uh, politically conscious and uh, provocative uh, talk. And uh, the questions will be about all the three talks. Uh, então, vamos passar as perguntas e as, elas podem ser feitas para todos os três é, é, conferencistas dessa manhã, dessa sessão, dessa quinta mesa. Né? É, a Maria Cecília já está com a mão levantada. Bom, é, obrigada, Antônio. Na verdade, eu só queria, antes de passar as questões, dar um aviso. Um, but I thank you three all for the very stimulating paper, but I will just give a, a, an information before, and then I will give the opportunity to other to start. And I, I have questions, but I will do it later. Um, eu queria só informar que aqueles interessados em assistir, que estão em Belo Horizonte, em assistir amanhã, a palestra do professor Jess, que está em Belo Horizonte, né? ele veio ao Brasil de um evento na Amazônia e veio a Belo Horizonte. Ele vai fazer uma palestra presencial amanhã na Universidade de Minas Gerais. Então, eu coloquei, uh, uh, eu vou colocar aqui no chat um, o informe e aqueles interessados é só chegar e assistir, tá? Obrigada, eu passo a palavra então ao Antônio novamente. Obrigado, Cecília, pelo 
aviso. Então, é, podemos passar para as questões. É, fiquem à vontade para é, né, levantar a mão aqui nesse ícone do aplicativo Zoom, ou então para é, pedir a palavra é, aqui pelo chat também. Eu estou é, consultando aqui o chat o tempo todo, caso alguém queira colocar a pergunta aqui, ou então fazê-la diretamente ao vivo aqui pelo Zoom. Acho que... Ah, ah, eu vou começar, então, acho que como ninguém tá levantou bom. a mão. É, well, I have a question to Jess. Uh, it, it's also a comment because of something that you said about the reception that you was um, you received the, the, the kind of advertising <laughs> advertisement to write your work on reception when you try a, a job position is it you you said this as a kind of joke or it is right I, it's so the anecdote about uh when i finished my phd and went on the job market uh-huh because it's curious uh there is it is an interview by anastasia bacogiani she's interviewing john solomon and he said that when he published his first book on the reception of classics in cinema uh this was it's the first book main in this area uh well the book was refused by 26 press only after 26 he managed to, to publish But after he published, they always consider him. He 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 said that he have to 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 avoid to say to, to try a job to to do this. And uh, it's curious that in some sense this prejudice is still continuing. And talking about prejudice, I was just wondering when you talk about what to do with to use or not use to classic to even destroy the. Uh, uh, the vision that classics is uh, um, a kind of instrument to keep the, the prejudice in some sense and, and this dilemma. No? And I was wondering about a case that it's very curious. It happens in Brazil in some sense and also in the United States. In the 50s, when we had in Brazil the Black Orpheus, And in that same times, a black media that was never performed until now for a, a company, a professional company. And it was forbidden to represent Brazil in, the, in a conference of Negritude in Dakar uh, because it didn't express the Brazilian culture. And it's curious, it was a black, media, a black media that came from Africa and uh, the, the, the play ends with media uh, killing the, the children because the children reminds her the blood of the colonizers. I think all of who are here can imagine how this was difficult, probably in Brazil, to, to, to read and even to accept that was performing. For this reason, in part, was never, never performing. In the same decade, we have in the United States a very interesting play that was transformed into film by Sidney Lumet, a very active, uh, politically active uh, director. And what he did, he took the play by Tennessee Williams. He, he had to affect people uh, regarding prejudice against Uh, black people, grand Afro descendant, was to put a white man in a very well considered white man like Marlon Brandon as a kind of Orpheus that it's uh, um, attacked by a sheriff from, from the county saying, Listen, you are not a nigger, use this word, but Think as if you were a nigger and go, go out from uh, this city, otherwise you are going to, to suffer. 
Uh, and I think it's a kind of uh, almost stood case how to deal. Now, this for me was a very good solution of Sidney Lumet to teach about uh, or to, uh, um, to attack a kind of prejudice, putting a white man and using this kind of imagination <laughs> feel né, in a conditional, feel yourself as a nigger. And to use Marlon Brando, a very uh, uh, well-accepted actor, already very famous, was a very, uh, a stratagem, very, uh, I think, um, interesting to make people feel or try to make people feel uh, what is a prejudice, what is to, to feel pain. Uh, it's curious because returning to this play uh, in Brazil, uh, Beyond the River, the Black Media, there is a moment in which all the white washerman, washerwomen, they are very against media, but when they see that media is suffering because of being abandoned, there is a very interesting line. They say, uh, the pain of a white, the pain of a black, it's same, the, it's always the same pain. It's just a comment about some strategy that uh, um, can be used and how to, to deal with such a difficult dilemma. I, it's just, sorry about my long comment. Uh, sure. Uh, I, let me speak to the, you know, the first topic of reception just briefly first, and then I'll uh, turn to um, uh, these medias. Um, yeah, you're. Uh, the anecdote, John Solomon, um, I think, is uh, an apt one. And again, my uh, experience, and it sort of was, uh, I think, a product of the time. I finished my PhD in 2011. So sort of, I think of it as being during a period when um, classical receptions uh, were, presses were finally, you know, and journals were finally publishing this work. There was a lot of excitement and, and press stamp, a statement uh, or standpoint, a lot of newfound market. Um, but that within um, the academic world, um, at least in classics, you know, if you get a comp conflict job, perhaps through that work at the time, uh, there just wasn't, uh, if that was the second or third thing on my list of things that I do, and I was just occasionally doing a reception piece and 75% of my work was traditional Latin philology. Um, that's what was expected on a job like application. Now, uh, when I look at you know, job ads, more and more institutions are privileging reception work um, in part because it helps with um, attendance in the classroom. Um, you know, courses and this stuff are really popular now. And um, so that what was in the process of becoming um, uh, marketable from a publishing standpoint has now become, uh, in the last 10, 10 years, I think much more attractive um, to um, for uh, university employment. Um, so I sort of you know, lived that process as I did my own uh, job search. Um, uh, one of the videos that you mentioned, um, uh, women uh, kills children because they remind her of experience. I mean, it reminds me a little bit of uh, Toni Morrison's uh, Beloved, uh, which is itself a media reception via um, a historical figure, Margaret Garner, um, in the U.S., who um, uh, in the mid-19th century uh, fled slavery with her children to freedom. And um, uh, when uh, it was hunted down by uh, slave hunters and finally caught, uh, she uh, killed uh, uh, in real life uh, child uh, so that prevent them from getting sent back to slavery. I think there's some overlap there in that you know, court case was, centralized, was uh, sensationalized in the U.S. as um, art in the newspapers as uh, uh, a modern idea. And so I, I think there's something there. But you, when you talk about uh, some of the uh, well, Black ideas, in, um, there's a, a really rich tradition of them as you point towards. And I think of um, it's an English volume, uh, an anthology, I think edited by uh, Kevin Whitmore, Whitmore on uh, 
uh, Black Medea's uh, on stage. And that example that you mentioned where um, sort of the, the racial dynamics are switched. Um, when I think about then how to work within these tensions of you know, not being fully able to break free from language and discourse, but um, you know, how can we get as close as possible? For me, uh, many of, whether it's a dramatic production or other forms of reception, um, for me, it's those, uh, those receptions that I would use the term intervention, that, that where the target text, the modern text, performs an intervention on its source text and text in ways that not only um, uh, inspire what whatever modern of thought or uh, uh, sharing, collective sharing of pain um, work aims at, but also uh, forces us to uh, uh, relook at and completely uh, revalue uh, the ancient source text. Um, I can think of a few examples and you know, with more time, I probably would have done some case studies. Um, I don't know if that starts to answer the question. Thank you, Professor Weiner. Um, let's see if someone uh, wants to ask uh, a question. Alguém quer mais fazer uma pergunta, fique à vontade, pode se manifestar, levantar a mão aqui do Zoom ou me escrever aqui pelo chat, eu também posso é, traduzir a pergunta. É, bom, aqui que I'd estou... like to say uh, just a few, few words, um, especially about the... Um, uh, First of all, the three talks were excellent. Thank you very much, Martin and Jesse and and uh, uh, Professor Mark. I, I didn't uh, know your work, but anyway, I thought uh, that the three um, talks uh, were very interesting. But I would like to uh, stress the importance of thinking about the themes uh, that Jesse um, and Mark brought to us today in our current uh, scholarship. This, uh, these debates are still not very um, intense in Brazil, but I, I see that uh, most people working on classical receptions nowadays and performance and um, uh, are, are dealing with that. And also I, I'm, I'm well aware of the work uh, Professor Martin Dinter is also doing on, on, on conflict resolution and uh, uh, the uh, the recent conferences, the one in Manaus. So I think this uh, these are really um, important topics and ways of dealing with them for us here, uh, classicists and not non classicists as well. People working on uh, culture and trying to um, you know bridge this terrible gap that's this chasm that's being built by the severe polarizations that we have been uh, seeing uh, around the world. Just as a uh, small comment and compliment on the topics, uh, on the way you uh, dealt with them and, uh, and also a way of uh, thanking you all for your, your talks today. And also I'd like to ask um, Jesse if um, maybe, have, have you, uh, seen any uh, recent attacks um, from, for example, the alt-right, specifically to um, inside the university or anything you have uh, personally witnessed, maybe something that happened to you um, since 2019 in San Diego or anything that's been uh, happening? How, how's the... The, the weather, <laughs> shall we say it like that, uh, in, in America now. And also if uh, the other um, colleagues would like to say something about that as well, you, you're, uh, uh, feel free and thank you very much. Sure, thank you so much, Rodrigo. Um, yes, uh, is the short answer that um, overwhelmingly within the academy, 
itself. Um, movements towards uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, um, thinking about how to do the labor of decolonization and anti-racist pedagogy um, are, is absolutely the dominant trend, but at the margins of this and especially um, outside of uh, the academy, um, the attacks continue. And um, uh, while I, uh, thankfully, I am still standing and uh, uh, have not received death threats, I myself, I think it was shortly after the 2019 um, uh, debacle in San Diego, I myself was, at least in a mild way, targeted by um, a right-wing right think tank. Um, uh, and it turns out that what I thought were re relatively you know, mild remarks uh, in the classroom um, were by a student who had been planting in my classroom uh, reported back to uh, this organization. And so there are these uh, sort of organizations on the fringes of academia and outside of academia um, that are uh, very much continuing to, um, uh, whether it's in the form of targeted attacks or uh, in the form of keeping uh, published lists of um, you know, these you know, dangerous Marxist indoctrinated uh, professors or what have you. Uh, uh, I don't think that's uh, uh, calmed down much. Uh, it's just those um, attack. That's more coming from the outside as opposed to um, the very public incidents um, at our you know, huge meetings. Uh, let others uh, speak to that. And then um, if there's a chance, I've got a question for Martin. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Weiner. Um, bom, se alguém tiver mais alguma pergunta a fazer, a ah, Julia, Julia, por favor. Hey, thank you, Antonio. Thank you very much for all the three talks. It was very inspiring. To uh, I have a question to Professor Martin Dinter. I really liked it, your exposition showing how this intermediate, um, we can see all this uh, different media in Ovid's Metamorphosis. And I like to ask you if, uh, is it possible to, uh, when, you when we think about Ovid's reception in other arts, do you think that, uh, because we have a lot of works in music and painture, sculpture that were inspired on Ovid's Metamorphosis, do you think that this um, deal, uh, Ovid's deal with other media in his own poem may have inspired this kind of work? Do you think we can make this relation about reception of Ovid? Yes, we, we actually, um, last year in, in, in KCL, in my, where I work, King's College, we did a course on Titian, T Tiziano, I think, in, uh, the painter, and Ovid. And together with a colleague um, who works in art history, and we, uh, he was basically always looking which parts of the text you can find in the paintings and how you know how it's translated or uh, how yeah changed into um, into painting. So yes, it's it's a, probably one of the most uh, transformed texts as well as you say. Yeah. But also there's a there's a novel this, this colleague in art history has written this novel called The Latinist. And it's about a Latin professor in, in Oxford. And uh, it's playing the Daphne, the Daphne story from the Metamorphosis, but with a professor and a student. So, so there's another, uh, another version here. So it's, it's just, as I have it here, um, one can show it. Yes, you're definitely right, that, that's true. That's why I chose Ovid as well, because they're the most examples for that kind of reading. Uh, thank maybe. you very much. Cecilia, por favor. No, uh, may I just in some sense second Julius in this question about Titian, uh, Martin, because I, I would like to, to know your opinion 
because I think you are talking about the very famous Ariadne and Dionysus. Is this one jumping from the? Uh, yes, yeah. There, there were several ones. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to remember which ones we used, but there, there, there were, uh, I think, four or five uh, we used. Also, yeah. sometimes there's just some something in the background which is taken from Ovid, so it's not the main, the main image or something. Uh -huh. but, yeah. yeah, I yeah. was thinking in this particular one because it puzzles me a lot, a, a bit, not a lot, but a bit, when Dionysus came and it, it is a kind of uh, love at first sight. And he came and he jumps from the uh, uh, the car, the, and and Ariadne is still almost looking to to the 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 departing, yeah, yeah, departing. And, but at the same time, it, it seems a kind of love that is like is sparkling. <laughs> it is, uh, as I said, the first sight love. But at the same time, in when you think in Arsamatoria, in the way that um love is a kind of play and everything is so premeditated how to seduce how to do this it's a bit conflicting these two at least the reception of uh yeah yeah, yeah definitely of yeah. Dionysus and also even in in Ovid this uh, uh, explosion of uh, attraction and so spontaneous against a kind of very calculated uh, approach to in Arsamatoria for men and women. What do you think about this? It, it, we, of course, we don't know how much of it Titian knew in the end and in what versions. So this was one of the questions you always have to ask, you know, is it, do they, do they know the text or do they know the text mediated by translation, summary, uh, rewriting, some of those questions. So we, we should not assume that Titian knew all of Ovid's works, for example. That's the other. So how we how we read them nowadays, side by side, we can't necessarily assume he's aware of that. I think. Sorry, yeah, that's all. That's all I can can. Uh, uh -huh. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to ask a question to Professor Fleischmann. Um, in your in your paper, you mentioned many times the the fragmentary character of the plays and the feelings of the characters, even if they were based on on Greek myths and tragedies, they were presented in a very uh, fragmentary, insufficient. Uh, mood, uh, a, a kind of uh, existential feeling of fragment of being a fragment that uh, is that appears in in many in the many ways these Greek myths and um, plays are presented in their modern versions, and I would like to know if uh, um, how this feeling and how these aesthetics of fragments uh, can be related to, if you think it, it can, how it could be related to uh, postmodernism perspective of the world in general, not only related to colonization and decolonization uh, and so on and so forth, but also to uh, kind of, um, um uneasiness uh, a lack of identification with uh, activity with uh present day society if we we can separate this feeling of being a fragment uh in these situations in general and uh, related to decolonization or not uh if if i could make myself clear um look i would i can respond to that in in a number of different ways um one way of responding it to so so clearly in what i was trying to in the two cases there are two different approaches the one does deal with 
um, a source which is then converted or changed into something new. And the other one, there is no original source, but there is something new which can be described in terms that uh, of a form that came from the past in some way. So there's this application of the idea of the tragic onto works that that emanated in a culture that didn't have the word tragedy or the tragic in that culture prior to the arrival of, of colonialism. In terms of the fragmentation and postmodernity, okay, the, the problem there, I think, is to use that language of postmodernity to describe the situation is, is problematic because of the close relationship in the first place between coloniality and modernity. So fundamentally in decolonial thinking, the praxis involves um, undoing a colonial matrix which is completely imbricated with modernity. There is, there is no, so in a sense to start defining what's going on in terms of post-modernity is counterproductive to the decolonial praxis itself because it's bringing, it's, it's, it's kind of retaining or keeping the grip of that coloniality, modernity, binary, um, or, or um, collect, uh, I don't know, grouping, um, uh, in, in the forefront of things, rather than trying to move it out of the picture completely and find other ways of doing so. So that's one way of, of thinking. I, you know, I wouldn't um, use the post-modernity idea, paradigm uh, myself, because it, it, it is, in a sense, um, anti-decolonial in some kind of way. However, um, I think also what I need to say is that what comes in fragments is the leftovers of the thing itself, of the source itself. So within the landscape of the colonial aftermath, one finds these texts, but these texts don't come in as a whole. They, they're not... Un, they're not Often they're, they're just bits and pieces of the text or an image from the text. People know, oh, Medea, she's the woman who killed her children. And that's it. There's no relationship to the play Medea as written. It, it, you know what I mean? In terms of Antigone, people might know the title. People might know the name of the character. People might know one thing. Oh, it's got something to do with um, this battle with Medea. But the, so what we receive in this context or what is left behind in the context is already fragmented. What then starts to happen is in the adaptation that fragment starts to reassemble and the question is to what extent can it be reassembled and in what forms does it take and it doesn't necessarily always come out as something fragmented in the end although in my particular production did, because it seemed to reflect to me a state of existential fragmentation that is at the heart of this kind of new South African post-apartheid um, condition. Yeah, I don't know if that explains uh, answers. Yes. Very, very well. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you. Well, uh, there is a, another question for Professor Fleischmann. Uh, if if you want to read it, Professor Fleischmann, it's in the chat. The last uh, question. Uh, while we were talking about the Black Office film, So I'm, I'm trying to understand what the particular problem is. It the problem that the films raise the issue of racism at all? Or is it a problem that the way the films raise the issue of racism in their time periods are read as racist today? I, I, I'm, I'm not quite clear of the... Well, I think the... Uh, first, it's very difficult to, to transfer contemporary, according to the author of this question, Caio Franco, it's very difficult to transfer this contemporary, according to him, this contemporary Brazilian or any colonized country's problem to the past, to the, the Greek myths or to a Greek tragedy, if I understood correctly. And the, the scene, he, he, he points out to 
examples to adaptations of the Orpheus myth, in both of which Orpheus, because I, I know these films, they, he's a, a part of the lower class Brazilian, Brazilians, and he, he lives in a slum, in a favela, as we call it. And uh, uh, I think he, he, Caio Franco doesn't think these adaptations were really satisfactory. Hmm. He is asking if you agree. I don't know the, the films particularly, so I can't comment on the films, but I, but I do believe it's not a simple transmission in any way, and, and that these things are complex attempts to try to link things. You know, one um, kind of decolonial line of decolonial thinking would say, we need to leave behind the past completely and move into um, and only concentrate on, on things that uh, emanate from the particular territory itself uh, that we find ourselves in the ex-colonial territory itself. Um, so in our case that we only focus on African material because we are based in Africa. Um, uh, unfortunately, that assumes that there is an other side to colonialism, that there is a way of getting beyond. Um, or, uh, and, and that if we can just find that other side, everything will be fine. Uh, there is no other side to colonialism, in my opinion. The, the, you know, we are all the survivors of the catastrophe that was colonialism. And one of the things that we have inherited through that process is these canonic, are these canonical texts, which include these classical works. So one, and I don't even think that people like Nguyue Thionga, for example, are necessarily saying that, because he writes a lot about uh, the Greeks and the, the effects the Greeks had um, in terms of uh, the relationship between the Greek dramaturgy and the dramaturgy of African uh, performance. Um, I, I, I think that rather what, what we have in the situation is a kind of tragic circumstance in which people are struggling over the inheritance from the past. And that inheritance is something which isn't about debt that needs to be repaid or a kind of, um, you know, paying the dues for this wonderful stuff that's arrived, but rather struggling with this material in quite a combative, quite a difficult struggle uh, in uh, context. And, and, I, and I kind of feel like the results are going to be a little bit kind of hit and miss. Um, but but uh, that's what I think is interesting about the project that we're working on. We're not simply saying these were the, the, the old archival representations from the 1950s and the 1960s. We're saying this is the work we're working on now. And we're bringing people together to struggle over this inheritance now in uh, the present as a way of trying to, to engage in a kind of process of decoding. And uh, do some of the complexity of of representation that that I think the person is pointing to here. I'm, I'm sort of struggling to be very articulate in that moment. Yes, thank you very much, Professor Fleischmann. Well, uh, if uh, there are no questions anymore, I think we can uh, finish our session. Thanking again our three guests and uh, hoping we'll meet uh, again uh, soon in, in, the, in the afternoon. Obrigado a todos, agradecendo aos participantes, sobretudo aos conferencistas, e esperando revê-los em breve na sessão agora de tarde. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Bye.